Ball rat is this way to enable people to drop their guard and reveal what they would say behind closed doors. It's much more interesting that the people that she visits, it's much more interesting if they've really got a good point. So I had to be really, really careful about making sure that every single person really had a, con a convincing argument. I started off just jotting down a bunch of memories. I had about like 80 memories. Um, and, and looking at them, I could see the semblance of a story. Like this family shows up because the dad takes this family and just plops them on this piece of land in the middle of nowhere. And I just needed to figure out how to put all the memories in the proper place to make this um, work as a story. My prediction is that you'll never see Donald Trump as an on-screen character because he's simply implausible as a character. You, you can write heroes and you can write villains, but there's no such thing as an interesting character who doesn't have a conscience. Knowing everything that was leading up to that night and everything that would happen within 12 months after that night, it was, I could pretty much ascertain if these guys were to have a debate, if these guys were to talk about what's on their mind on this given night, what that conversation would entail. My brother and I wrote pages and pages and pages of sound description. You know, the first two words of the script are he hears. On a camera level, we don't show POV until the end of the movie. The whole movie's POH. It's a point yeah. of hearing. Creating a, a character with very strong emotional arc, like Fern, that can anchor us, allow you to, you understand what's the emotional thing mm -hmm. in a um, very unpredictable environment suddenly you find yourself in, but you know what you're looking for. That arc has to be very strong, very simple. I wanted the audience to be in an active position. Uh, not just to sit and to watch a story already told, you know, right. but try to understand. You know, I wanted the father to be not only a story, but an experience and to play with the feeling of disorientation. I wanted it to be really fun and interesting and compelling and that the thriller element really felt real. And so if... It was never going to work if Cassie, you know, our lead, was going around kind of telling people off for doing the wrong thing. It's much more interesting that the people that she visits, people who maybe had a hand in the thing that happened in the past, it's much more interesting if they've really got a good point. So I had to be really, really um, honest and really careful about um, making sure that every single person really had a con a convincing argument because otherwise it just seems too easy. I kind of took a break from filmmaking for a few years after my daughter was born and uh, I was just trying to wrap my head around like the, the types of films that I might want to make um, moving forward and um, it was around the time that my daughter reached the age of the the character of David who you see in the film that I was kind of seeing things through her point of view more uh, and remembering what it's like to be her age when we were moving to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, and I also read this book uh, by Willa Cather um, called My Antonia, in which she talks, she, she writes a story about growing up on a farm in Nebraska. And she had mentioned this quote about just how much her work took off once she started to really remember rather than just admire, like admire other writers. Um, and I, I kind of felt like maybe I was doing that in my own work and I felt inspired to sit back and try to remember what it was like uh, to be a child and to create something that I could even leave behind for my daughter. And, and that's basically the genesis of this project. I started off just jotting down a bunch of memories. I had about like 80 memories. Um, and, and looking at them, I could see the semblance of a story, like this family shows up because the dad... Uh, takes this family and just plops them on this piece of land in the middle of nowhere. And then uh, by the end, you know, there's a fire and, and there's also a patch of Minari uh, that seems to grow. The only thing that seems to really last on this farm. Um, so I kind of felt there's this interesting through line of a story and I just needed to figure out how to put all the memories in the proper place to make this um, work as a story. Uh, Aaron, 2020 has been one for the books. I'm curious, does watching a year like this play out make you want to write about it? And what would the finale look like? Please tell me it won't be Revenge of the Murder Hornets. Uh, it wouldn't be if I wrote it, uh, I think. But uh, listen, a lot will be written about these uh, about these last few years uh, by screenwriters and by playwrights. but. 
my my prediction is that you'll never see Donald Trump as an on-screen character. That he'll always be off-screen. That you'll see him on televisions and news footage because he's simply implausible uh, as a character. Uh, and I, you, you can write heroes and you can write villains, but there's no such thing as an interesting character who doesn't have a conscience. The sound perspective stuff came very early. It's like I said, that may have been 12 years ago that I kind of, I kind of was dreaming. I found myself dreaming about this cinematic language, but then it was the process of earning it. You know, I knew that I knew that I was kind of, I, I had kind of received this incredibly special, um, framework. And then it was about how to earn this on a, on a, on a story level and a character level. And, you know, it's interesting you say that, that you felt that gut punch with the silence, because what a shocking idea that the absence of all sound can be a gut punch. And I think that as it relates to writing or painting or all the arts, the space between the notes and music, what is that? What is it about the absence? How do you earn the absence? We, my brother and I wrote pages and pages and pages of sound description that didn't even make it into the film, but just so we understood it. I mean, it didn't make it into the final script. Much of it is there, but but really that's about, you know, the first two words of the script are he hears, you know, and you're, and that's before you see the picture, he hears, and then you come to picture and the, and the whole shape and the last line of the script the first two words of the last line are he sees. And so you move, there's a very simple arc to that because we actually don't show on a, on a camera level, we don't show POV until the end of the movie. The whole movie's POH, it's a point yeah. of hearing. So it's, really, so it's really written from that point of hearing and very diligently so. Oh, uh, Shaka, you, you almost humanize the agent Miller um, in the in in the script and in, in the film, you know, can you tell us about about doing that? About I mean, I'm not saying it's. A, I think it's a terrific uh, choice, but can you tell us about humanizing uh, Miller? Well, I mean, I think it's more. So one of the things we discovered um, was that this guy had investigated the Freedom Riders murders in uh, Mississippi, and so. It was just fascinating to us that he, you know, years apart was investigating the Klan and then, you know, years later was tasked with dismantling the Illinois chapter of the Panthers. I thought there was a real opportunity there to um, just so just show the complexity of really, you know, white centrism as an ideology. You know what I mean? Like this is a guy who, you know, he thinks he's doing the right thing. Uh, in a lot of ways. And, you know, he, I think it's it's been interesting to sort of watch how different viewers view that character. Like we were really fortunate in that before the pandemic happened, we had a screening with like six black, you know, audience members and six white audience members. And their, their reads of that character were fascinating um, because, you know, a, a lot of the white audience members were like, well, I, I, he didn't seem like, you know, to be that bad of a person. I was wondering like when he made the shift was, you know, our black audience members were like, what are you talking about? He compared the Panthers to the Klan and that right, told me exactly. everything I needed to know about him right then and there. On that day, there was a march of many members of the upper class in England to protest the right to hunt foxes. And I thought, oh, these are great targets. And I went undercover as, I think Borat was from Moldova at that point, he had a different name. But again, it was the same, it was more for satirical aim because I was going through and I go, in my country, we hunt the Jews. We give them, you know, 30 minutes and then we chase after them. Would you do that here? And people go, well, I suppose, well, um, uh, how many, if it was 30 minutes and it was fair, then, you know, I suppose so. If it was sportsman, you know, and then I realized at that point, oh, Borat is this way to enable people to drop their guard and reveal what they would say behind closed doors. 
because they felt that this was never going to be on British TV. I'm curious, how was it liberating to take the story from stage to screen? Did you find that you were able to open it up? Was it daunting? I mean, how did that work for you? What I did not want to do is just to film a play because, you know, I think it's, it's not very exciting. It's not challenging. I wanted to do something very cinematic. So I kept the narrative of the play because I think that it was what was original about it, which is to try to tell the story from the inside and to put the audience in a very unique position as if they were trying to go through a labyrinth, trying to figure it out, trying to understand what is going on in a way. I wanted the audience to be in an active position. Uh, not just to sit and to watch a story already told, you know, right. but try to understand. And as if, as if they were experiencing something, you know, I wanted the father to be not only a story, but an experience and to play with the feeling of disorientation because it's about a, a man losing his bearings. It's about dementia. And I wanted the audience to experience a way Absolutely. of dementia, yeah. as if they were losing their own bearings. And, um, and so it was a way for me to play with the feeling of disorientation. And I thought it was very cinematic. But again, I, I wanted to do something that the cinema can do and that only the cinema can do. And I think you just kind of struck this extraordinary balance of like spontaneity and preparation um, that just like set a new standard in my mind for how I want to make films. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and, you know, it does start with writing because because. Jessica Buder's book is a collage. Mm -hmm. It's so diverse and so wide how much she is able to capture a, a time in this country for an entire generation of people uh, mm -hmm. shifting, uh, changing their lives. And, and so creating a, a character with very strong emotional arc and like ferns that can anchor us, allow you to find, like, you know, you go to this beautiful town or you, you you know you you're in this in a in a hurricane you understand what's the emotional thing mm. in a um, very unpredictable environment suddenly you find yourself in but you know what you're looking for and your dp knows what you're looking for your actors know what you're looking for that that arc has to be very strong very simple mm. um so then you're not just capturing whatever out there it's yeah. intentional it isn't just go there verite everything you know, so then when he shows up there, he's like, okay, I know where this character emotionally needs to be. So I'm going to shoot a certain way, even though I had all the options in the world. Just, just talk a little bit about putting words in the mouths, because nobody really ever reported what happened in that room. But, right. but, but you had to put words in the mouths of people we are familiar with, but yet have it be based on fact. Just talk, talk through a little bit of that. Right. I mean, the, the interesting thing was when I first found out, of course, this was a very real night, the night, February 25th, 1964, when Cassius Clay beat Sonny Liston. He did go back to Malcolm's room at the Hampton House and spend the evening, most of the evening in quiet conversation with Malcolm, um, Jim Brown and Sam Cooke. And the next morning is when he announced that he was in the Nation of Islam. Everyone knows about the relationship between Ali and Malcolm X, but Sam Cooke was really the oddball right there. It was like, what's he doing there? And when you started digging into Sam Cooke, you went like, wow, this guy was kind of working within the system. So Sam did these very subtle tells that kind of, I think, alluded to the influence of people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and this idea of like black self-reliance. I, I like to tell people, I saw these four men not as the civil rights movement, but as the nascent black power movement. And that's a key, key difference. So no, having that information, knowing, I just figured, you know, knowing everything I know about these guys, when I decided to write it as a play, knowing everything that was leading up to that night and everything that would happen within 12 months after that night, it was, I could pretty much ascertain if these guys were to have a debate, if these guys were to talk about what's on their mind on this given night, what that conversation would entail. And then from there, it was about, okay, now let's forget about them being icons because the doors are closed. So just like, you know, a, a, it's like a famous person comes home, the, ca the cameras are flashing, they close the doors and they relax. Let's be motivated by like them as human beings, them as real people. And for that element of it, 
you know, I took all the information I had, but then emotionally, I just went, honestly, Kwame, I went back to the same debate that I would have with my friends at like the freshman dormitory at Howard. You know, it's the debate, <laughs> it's the debate that groups of black men have been having for God knows how long, you know what I mean? It's like, when you talk about, you, you talk about Lincoln Perry and step and fetch it, right? He was yep. both, he was one of the first black millionaires ever known, but hey, in order to become a millionaire, all he had to do was perpetuate negative images of black people that would affect, infect us for generations. We would have visceral debates about that <laughs> in college. Yeah. So it was like, I want to bring those visceral debates to this play. But again, so, once again, put the put the idea, put the words into the mouths of the guys who influenced that manner of thinking, whether it be so, Malcolm, so, Ali, mm -hmm. Sam, or Jim. It's, it's a first person narration, the novel, and mm -hmm. the way Arvin wrote that character's thoughts were so specific, so funny, so insightful, you know, kind of wild. And so I just knew it had to be first person narration from the beginning. I had only done that in the short film that Josh mentioned, Plastic Bag, where Werner Herzog is the voice of this bag going on this existential journey. And that was the only time I had used anything like voiceover. So I went back and looked at um, Kind Hearts and Coronets, uh, Jules Jim. So back, back in that time period, I, I saw those and then I jumped forward to um, Fight Club which I thought was really interesting because Ed Norton's voiceover is, it's about him, it's his perspective, but it's also sometimes social commentary, mm -hmm. which Balram's character in The White Tiger has. Um, it's also kind of funny, it's darkly comic. And then Goodfellas, Wolf of Wall Street, Taxi Driver. Um, Goodfellas was really interesting because it's an epic story. And this is the first time I've ever dealt with an epic story. You have Balram's childhood, his time as a servant, and then three years later when he's a successful entrepreneur in Bangalore. Um, and so the, studying those really helped. 